the Almost Perfect Podcast. Welcome to the Almost Perfect Podcast, a celebration of fuck-ups, failures, and falling flat on your face. This is a podcast that believes you can learn from experience, but that experience doesn't have to be your own. Ha, I'm but perfect, and I'm a functional fuck-up. Let's learn from somebody else's mistakes. And today we are learning from Siba Piwe Matiela, who is a newsreader slash radio broadcaster and voiceover artist. So yeah, you're about to hear some sultry tones in just a little while, and you're going to learn what it is like to be a voiceover artist and to be a newsreader for over a decade. I think it's been like 15 years that she's been in the game, although recently, unfortunately, she was one of the people that got caught up in this nonsense with the SABC, and they're not renewing contracts, and they're firing lots of different people and yeah they're they're cutbacks so Sibs is in a pretty weird space at the moment she's trying to navigate the post 5fm world because she used to be on 5fm up until very recently and yeah she's trying to figure out what she's going to do next so we caught it at an interesting time and it's an interesting time for a lot of people in this country. I think a lot of people have lost their jobs over this last year. Some of you listening to this probably have as well. I know in my industry, I mean, shit, I I, I did. I, I lost my job. Yeah. And a couple other opportunities, but some other opportunities on the table for me now. And I'm looking forward to those and I'm going to try and make the most of every little thing that I can as soon as I can. But I know it's difficult, man. And yeah, Sibs shares some of the struggles and some of the difficulties of being left in the lurch by the SABC recently. And also, you know, we we get into so a lot of positive stuff, man, because she has really made a lot of things happen for herself. She's someone who hustles and has managed to always find a gap, always find a way into doing the thing that she wants to do and I find that pretty fucking admirable. So I don't doubt that things are going to go quite well for Sibs as time goes on. And this is just a small hurdle. And I'm really grateful for her for sharing her time with us at, you know, this fairly difficult time because she does discuss, like I said, life after 5 FM and what it all means and what the opportunities are and how she's feeling. And we also discuss so much more. We discuss her queerness, which is something that, weirdly enough, I mean, I've had quite a few queer guests on this podcast, but we don't really talk about it because I know that if you're gay or if you're trans or if you're non-binary, that almost every interview you do, you're going to get asked questions about it. And I would like to just ask you questions about you. And if it comes up, then we'll talk about it. That's kind of my philosophy. Or if, you know, you're an activist and that's what you talk about and it's a big part of things. But just in general, it's something that hasn't necessarily been discussed on this podcast. And we have had quite a few queer guests on this podcast, people in the alphabet gang, as they say. And yeah, it's been a rough week for a lot of people, actually, not just for the queer community. But of course, there's been a lot of brutal murders Lately, um, and in other spaces, there's been, we had a schoolgirl die by suicide uh, because of bullying. We've had uh, Nelly Tembe, aka's fiance, she passed away recently. We also had Pomlani Pakoli pass away this week, and he was a guest on this podcast. He wasn't someone I knew well at all, but I am going to re-release that podcast with a new intro uh, when when I can, um, when I know what I want to say there. And yeah, it's just been a very dark, dark, dark week in South Africa and in our communities. And I know that maybe you're feeling hopeless, maybe. Uh, things like these tend to compound, it seems. You know, the darkness is all enveloping and reaches out to a lot of people. But at the same time, we have to celebrate life. We have to celebrate the people who have passed and celebrate their lives by taking it forward, by 
living the way they would live and letting them inspire you and letting them be a part of your life going forward. So I know it might seem, I don't know, these words might seem empty at the moment, depending on where you're at. But I know that we have to just, we have to have hope that things are going to get better. And we have to also take action to make sure that that does happen. We have to, in our own ways, ensure that we leave the world a better place than we found it. I think, I, I believe that. I know not everyone does. I know not everyone acts that way. I don't always act that way, if I'm completely honest. But I do believe that that's, that's the goal, isn't it? Like, that's a pretty cool goal. Life's pretty fucking meaningless anyway. So why not just try and make it dope? Why not try and make it better for other people and for yourself? And figuring out what that means is quite a lot. And we have so many pressures in this world. We've got so much on us in so many different ways. And it's fucking tragic because it doesn't have to be this way. Like, we we know that the future could be better. We can imagine a better future And yet we've got fucking Robocop Alsatians, you know, (laughs) before hoverboards. So I don't know, but we've got to fight shit, man. We've got to, we really do. We just have to, we have to, we have to make it better. We have to just do our fucking damnedest to try and live in a better world than we do at the moment. And I know that's going to be difficult and I don't know what that actually means or entails, but I'm sure there's some literature online that might be able to help you and me figure this out going forward. So I just want to say, I wish you strength wherever you're at right now. And I hope, yeah, man, I hope it doesn't get you down for too long, but also feel those feelings, embrace it, let it pass through you and then come back stronger do need to let you know that this podcast is brought to you by you which means you can support it by going to patreon.com forward slash almost perfect at the moment i'm trying to get 5,699 rand together currently at about 2,500 rand and this is based so that i can use hindenburg forever this is a dope editing software kind of specifically made for radio and for podcasting i've been trying to trial for the second time now uh, cause, uh, I, anyway, doesn't matter how I managed to get a second trial. I don't even be able to get a third is the point. So I'm trying to get enough cash to buy the whole fucking thing. And, uh, no, what I mean is to support this wonderful company and make sure that, you know, people get paid for their work, which is partially true. So yeah. If you want to help me do that, go to patreon.com forward slash almost perfect. Alternatively, you can buy a mug from me. They're 100 rand each and 10 rand from each sale goes to Sasonke. Sasonke is an organization that is working to decriminalize sex work. They are sex workers themselves and they support sex workers around the country in a number of different ways. I suggest you go check them out at sasonke.org.za. Yeah, I think you're going to enjoy those chats with subs quite a lot. I I definitely felt inspired. She's lived in lots of different cities and really bet on herself a lot. And it's mostly paid off. Like I said earlier, it is a dark time. It is a tough time for her at the moment. But I really don't have any doubt that she is going to bounce back stronger than ever. That brings us to the shout out now over at patreon.com forward slash almost perfect. There is a tier, it is the top tier. It's called the titular titles tier. It is a $10 tier. And at this tier, you can pick your title right here on this podcast. It's kind of like an internship of sorts, except for you pay for it. And we've got quite a few people signed up to this scheme. I mean, to this uh, totally not a scheme. Definitely not at all a scheme. It's not herbal laugh, I promise. You get real benefits from this. Like you get to pick your title on this podcast. So shout outs to the following people. We've got a few new people because I did put it out on the internet that I'm looking to buy Hindenburg. Fucking interesting name for a program. I'm just going to tell you. It hasn't crashed on me yet. It hasn't blown up my computer. 
but yeah, interesting name for editing software. But yeah, we got a few new people that have signed up to the Patreon this week. So shout outs to Karan Chetty, who is assistant to the regional manager. Shout outs to Karan Slemon, who's back. He has been upgraded, no longer the almost perfect youth group leader. He is now the almost perfect hedge fund manager. That is quite an upgrade, and I'm looking forward to seeing those profits. I want to see some big returns, Karan. So shout outs to you. Thank you for coming back on board. We have also got an anonymous benefactor. So 10, I don't know, 10 points to whoever guesses who that is. Uh, we've also got Vishendra Naidu, who is the spiritual advisor. We have got King Julian. We have also got our executive producer, Stephen Olafia. Shout outs to you. Shout outs to all of you. Shout out to Kath Jenkin, who is the inevitable ruler of the universe and Queen Swifty. Shout outs to our chief sales officer of subtle heresies in the greater Oberberg region, Rousseau. And lastly, shout outs to Tyrant Love, a pantsless weasel. Man, it is so cool to just see this list keep growing. And I am so fucking thankful and so fucking grateful to every single one of you, to everyone at every tier uh, over at patreon.com and just you right now listening to this, whether you're chucking in a few shekels and you know helping helping keep the lights on at almost perfect headquarters or whether you're just listening to this supporting it liking it sharing it rating it reviewing it if you're over at itunes you know just leave a little review there goes a long way if you're signed up to the mailing list if you check out the website hey i tend to i'm kind of doing a lot of things it's weird i just noticed that now i always think to myself doing nothing with my life and then I just said all of that and I'm like, oh, maybe, maybe you're doing some things and maybe you can get involved in those things by going and checking them out over at Almost Perfect Decoded and Almost Perfect on the social medias. Oh yeah, if you need to get in touch with me at all, you can hit me up at bob at almostperfect.co.z. I don't want to start reading out some listener emails if that becomes a thing. If you want to pitch some things to me, maybe you want to advertise, maybe you want to be a guest on the podcast. Send me your stuff, bob at almostperfect.co.z. I might feel a little awkward and leave you on red for a little while, but I'll probably eventually get back to you, hopefully. Uh, also, coming up next week on the Almost Perfect podcast, we have Luis Ogola, and that was a fantastic chat that I'm really excited for you to hear. So look out for that coming out next week, Friday. But right now, here comes the Almost Perfect podcast with Subapiwe Matiela. So how are you living, Sibs? I am alive. Does that count? It definitely does. I mean, it is <laughs> something. It's it's good enough for now, I would guess. <laughs> Considering... I'd say. I'm living in a in a breathy, um, drinking water and eating food kind of way, but not much else is really happening. Uh, I guess, I mean, we can actually probably just get into straight off the bat because you are... Yeah, like having a bit of a harder time at the moment. And that's because you recently left your long-time job at 5FM. So how, yeah, how have you been handling these last few weeks? Because it sounds like it's been a bit difficult. Yeah, I mean, I would say absolutely not great. You know, it's it's been so interesting to watch other people's, you know, because obviously I'm not the only one who, who left um, the station or the organization. And certainly I'm not the one who's even been there the longest people like Sureshni Ryder, who's worked at 5FM for 18 years, also no longer works there. Um, Forbes and Fix, who had the longest running yeah. team show, you know, for nine years also. And it's so strange because everyone else seems to be in this really like celebratory mood or like a, yeah, new beginnings. I'm going to start something, you know, and they're just so gracious and accepting and excited for this new chapter. And I'm like, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> this sucks. <laughs> and I hate everything about it. And I can't lie about it. So yeah, it's been an incredibly difficult time for me, I think. Well, that's because radio has been your passion for so long. And it's literally been your job for so long. And from what I understand, these, well, what's happened with 5FM, what's happened with the SABC lately, it seemed to happen by surprise. I'm not going to say 
by surprise, but yes, also by surprise. So the way <laughs> that things work, <laughs> let me explain. The way things work at the SABC, specifically with on-air talent, right? And let's not forget that over the past year, you know, we've seen the retrenchment process happening with the Section 189, you know, people getting retrenched. I think they've let go to date of about 621 permanent staff members. So obviously, as the on-air staff who are independent contractors, we were always also expecting to get the boot or a few of us to get the boot or to be somehow brought into it because we're much easier to get rid of, mainly because we worked on one-year contracts, which then would expire at the end of the year and then you'd get offered like a new contract or a renewal um, to basically just keep on doing what you've been doing for the number of years that you've been doing it for. The shock is that... Fortunately or unfortunately, you get very used to this is my job. This is what I do. This is what I come and do every day. And I'm competent at it. So it's not like you're having meetings where you're discussing like your KPIs or like. Like you're the voice of your nationally known voice that everyone is quite familiar with. And you were good at your job. So I wouldn't say competent. I'm just going to throw that out. (laughs) Thank you. That's very kind. And I mean, there have been occasions where I've been told, you know, I I do suck and I'm not good at this and, you know, I don't belong there. But let's not get into that now. So it's there's almost like no measure of like how you know if you're doing well or how you know if like you're on the chopping block, like in the year to come or anything like that. There's just a knowledge and an expectation that, you know, things will more or less remain the same as long as you don't fuck up royally. Like you don't swear on air or you don't show up to work drunk or you don't like not show up to work at all and things like that. But See, I guess that's why I could never last in radio. Like all yeah. those things you just said there, it was just like, huh, not for me. <laughs> <laughs> that's very much you how I live my to, day. You get used to holding your tongue. Like it becomes second nature to just know as soon as you're in studio, you're just like, oh, okay. This is, you just pretend like there's a child nearby. Just imagine there's a small child close to you and you don't want to get into trouble for teaching them the wrong things. And that's how you attack the situation. Yeah, no, I'm just joking because on on radio, I was fine. I mean, I I will say that the very first time that I did a link, I swore because the guy was, it was, well, it was actually the first time I did a link on a show, a proper show because I'd been doing a guest report. I was just doing the gig guard mm. on DYR in the mornings. And then they put me on the lunch show with another guy. And he told me before the link, he was like, yo, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to say this. You're going to say that. Then you throw it back to me. And it's cool. And then he said everything. Like, he didn't no. say like, he didn't, And then he threw it to me. And I was just like, oh, <laughs> fuck. Literally. And yeah, that was the start of my radio career. So gotcha. I'm, I'm glad I got two years out of it. But <laughs> have you ever accidentally said something on air that you weren't meant to? Or have no, you been absolutely. managed in 10 years? Definitely. Oh, you have. I've gotten, yeah. I mean, I've been, I started on campus radio in 2006. Wait, I haven't finished my other story. Oh, sorry, but... sorry. I, this, this is my problem. <laughs> like I told you, we're going to go all over the place here. Okay. Let me finish my other story. Because my point was that it was shocking and surprising and not a good time for me because not because I expected to like be in this position or be in this job or like be the only one to be able to do it for the rest of my life. Obviously in any, you know, especially in the media, there'll be like up and coming people, new people, better people, whatever, everything is cool. But as a person who lives in a single income household to get a warning two weeks before my last show that I won't be working for said organization anymore, really like threatened my livelihood in the most extreme way. So you go from like being fine. I have a job. I love my job. I'm good at my job to being like, holy shit, who's going to pay my fucking bills? What the fuck am I going to do? And literally, it's like the walls start closing in on you because there's panic. So, and and obviously, like, not enough time to sort of make a plan or, like, apply somewhere else or even wrap your head around, like, the traumatic thing that's happening to you. So because I think for anyone, losing their job is a, is a completely traumatic thing, especially when you don't think you've done anything wrong or when you, you know, there's nothing you could have done to have prevented it, I guess. It's, you know, I was told we just don't have room for you anymore. So how do you argue with something like that? 
and you know, I, it's not necessarily that I even wanted to argue. It's just having the opportunity to prepare myself mentally and financially and, and all of these things. And I, I didn't have that. And I think that's why I was so, and I'm still, you know, really, really struggling. Reeling with it. From it. Mm. Did, did you feel betrayed? Mm. No. Okay. No. Why, like I, I would have imagined just personally, like, after giving 10 years to a company, but maybe you've always known that that's how corporate life is. I think, yeah, I think we have an understanding, you know, there's a, there's a great divide between the decision makers and the people who are actually on air behind the mic, producing, presenting, pushing the buttons and doing those things. So yes, in that sense, there's a, there's a huge sense of loyalty and camaraderie there, but we also know that, you know, when it comes to the people at the top, those aren't necessarily your friends. Those aren't necessarily people who've got your back. You know, those are people making business decisions, trying to make the most money for a particular organization. And they don't give a fuck about you at the end of the day. They care about the bottom line, which is completely normal. Every business functions like that. Yeah, we live in a literally, we live in a capitalist society. That is. Yeah. And it's bullshit. So there was no sense of betrayal necessarily. It was just, I think it was just hurt. I think I just felt hurt. And the reason I felt hurt actually is because again, this notice period is so unsustainable and so malicious in in my opinion, because you are literally like kicking someone out onto the street and not giving a fuck about what happens next. Do you know what I mean? I think that's the, that's the most hurtful thing. Other people have like husbands or wives or like partners that they can rely on to like, you know, pay the bills for this month until I find something else. But there's absolutely no regard for like, I don't know. I just, yeah, there was a lack of regard there and a lack of humanity and a lack of empathy that was, is, is unforgivable. And the, also the biggest issue there is they know that it's not like you can just go to another radio station now because so many other radio stations are also, you know, cutting down staff. Hmm. So it's this mass thing where so many people, like you're saying, some people you know, in your field or like, yes, you know, new start. I've gotten what I wanted out of radio yeah. and everything like that. But then there's so many other people who are now in this, in the lurch essentially yeah. and having to figure out what to do next. But I can assume that you probably would be looking at podcasting as a method because you have done podcasts. I know you did the lockdown podcast for 5FM. So is that I did, but I, at the moment? definitely, um, only because I'd like to apply myself, you know, creatively. I think, you know, I've been a newsreader for over 10 years. And a lot of the time I was bogged down, I guess, by the horror of it all. Every day was, you know, having to engage with this really horrific reality of the world because we don't report good news, right? We report the horrific things. Five children have been gang raped and left for dead. A person's body was like burnt to death. I mean, burnt beyond recognition and, and left in a why, field. Why does that happen? Because I remember, it's a, like, so I also, I didn't go to journalism school or anything. So I haven't learned these things necessarily. But I remember when I was hosting a show and yeah, the newsreader would constantly just talk about the darkest stuff. And like, it would just bring me down so much. And I always wondered, why does radio focus on that? I think it's all news, if we're perfectly honest. I mean, all international news, all local news, that's just how, that's what's newsworthy, right? What is a notable thing that's happened in the world? Unfortunately, if we lived in a better society, maybe we'd have better things to report. But we can't ignore the fact that five children were killed in a shack fire that no one knows the cause of. That's, unfortunately, that's newsworthy. Yeah, what we should but be it, doing is like fixing society so we can get to a point that we do have better things to report on. Oh, we fixed the hole in the ozone layer. Everything's looking great. Oh, you know, we've picked up all of the plastic in the ocean and we've disposed of it in an environmentally friendly way. I would love to report on those stories, but they don't <laughs> exist. <laughs> and that's wow. the problem. She, so being a newsreader really leaves you jaded. I guess so. Yeah, it's it can be really, really tough. I mean, I remember there was a time, I think it was after the passing of Uyinene Mugayana or a year after, and literally that whole week, 
day after day, there was another woman being murdered, another one being stabbed to death, another one being shot by her husband who then shot the children and then turned the gun on himself literally every single day. And you come to work and you do this job and then you actually leave and you're terrified. You're terrified to move. You're terrified of like any space that you occupy. I just read a story now. Um, the ENCA team was reporting on a story in Kailicha and they were robbed of their equipment at gunpoint literally this evening. So wow. <laughs> it's like, you can't catch a break. And I mean, if that's we've the kind seen of people get mugged on SABC, like yeah. we've literally watched people getting mugged whilst reporting the news. It's terrifying. You do. Do I leave my house? Do I stay in my house? Like all of the time. And I think now, fortunately, I get an opportunity to decide when and how I engage with the news. And so going back to your question, podcasting is definitely something I'm going to start doing more of um, just because I get to express myself and sort of stretch myself in the more creative ways that I like to do. I was wondering, with news reading and stuff, were you ever looking to work your way up, you know, into other positions or were you always happy with being a news reader? Because I would assume that that would be like something that would happen. You would go, cool, I want to be in radio. I want to be a presenter. How do I, you know, work my way up the ladder to that point? Or am I wrong there? That's such a funny question because people ask me that all the time. They're like, when are you going to get your own show? You're so good on the radio. Oh, you should work on television. Oh, I see you on BBC. And I'm just like, I, I, I appreciate, first of all, the fact that, you know, there are people who see me and think I'm talented enough to do all of those things. And I really appreciate that kind of support. But I have been on radio being a broadcaster since the year 2006. It is what I love. It's what I was born to do. It's what I am good at. And I know I can be good at very many things, but this is my career. And I always joke and I say, like, it's funny with like lawyers and doctors. No one ever asks them, like, what are you going to do next? What else do you do for <laughs> money? Or like, oh, what's your next career move? No, mate, I'm a lawyer. Or like, no, I'm, I'm a surgeon. I'm going to keep, you know, cutting people open and, and making them better. Do you know what I mean? But suddenly you're in yeah. this industry and it's like, oh, you've always got to be on this grind and this hustle and working towards the next best thing. My best thing I had, I had it. That was my dream. And I lived it every single day. And I was grateful for that and to be in that moment. Unfortunately, the universe has now pushed me out of that space. And so, yeah, I have to reinvent myself. I have to think of new things. I have to go in a different direction. What was that word of 2020? I have to pivot. Oh, yes. <laughs> my career now has to pivot and I'm being forced in that position, into that position, but probably for my greater good. And so I'm not resisting at all. And obviously it's time for other people, like I said, to, to move into the space that I did occupy and live their dreams. And they absolutely deserve that as well. So... <laughs> yeah, that is the thing with radio, unfortunately, is that there are always going to be new people coming up as well because there are so many people trying to get into radio these days. And it is just a saturated environment. So I guess the thing is that you don't have job security when it comes yeah. to radio, especially not at the moment. I mean, there's so much competition in terms of talent and there aren't that many slots on air anymore. Yep. So it is just a matter of finding other ways to get your voice out there. And I do think you would definitely handle podcasting, but what kind of podcasting would you like to do? Um, Similar to my, so the first podcast I did for 5FM was commissioned in, I think 2018. And it was called Stay Work okay, With Sips I before that. I did this lockdown one. Yeah, the lockdown one was just an extension of it. And obviously for lockdown purposes, because this was a new thing that was happening and we were trying to expand our reach in terms of the content that we were producing so we were doing like games online and like tiktok videos and all over the socials and the podcast was just one of the elements in terms of like our digital offering but stay work with sib started in 2018 and that podcast was the first time like i my bosses at the time justine cullinan and grant nash were just like go wild babes like whatever you want to talk about whatever you're interested in go for it and I really felt like this sense of like, I don't know, like finally, this is what I've been waiting for, you know, because 
you didn't have the restrictions of the BCCSA or um, ads that need to play or not being able to swear on air or not being able to talk about sex before 7 p.m. or not being able to (laughs) talk about liquor or even do a show drunk. (laughs) You know, I could now do all of these things. And so I spoke about everything that's important to me. I spoke about gender. I spoke about queerness. I spoke about the arts. I spoke about, God, you know, Black Lives Mattering. I spoke about all sorts of things. Mental health, which is, you know, very close to my heart. As someone with, you know, mental health struggles and who's had to overcome so much, it was so important to me to create something that would be a tool for other people who had issues like me, you know, to, to be able to gain something, some kind of value from it or some kind of help or some kind of guidance like, oh, fuck, Sibs also is like struggling to get out of bed and brush her teeth in the morning and this is what she does? Maybe I can try that. It was just so important for me to do that. So definitely more of that. Okay, so you I'm seem to have a, a plan for that. Yeah, I'm more of a like, let's everybody like, let's just band together and help each other and have fun in like, the most productive and awesome ways possible. Cool. So people can look out for that in the (laughs) near future, I'm going to assume. But let's go back. Let's go back to the past. Where are you originally from? Because I know you live in Joburg, but I don't know your history. I have tried to do a little bit of research on you, but there isn't enough on you at the moment, or at least Google's (laughs) hiding it from me. No, Google's not hiding it. I always tell my girlfriend I'm basically like a G-list celebrity, so that's why you'll only find a few things about me on the internet, but I like it that way. I'm originally from a small town called Mtata in the Eastern Cape, which, of course, is where some of the best people come from. Nelson Mandela, Anelim Doda. um, Who else is from there? Who else is from Mtata? I mean, you would know better than me. Just the best people. I'm about to claim Trevor Noah as well, but I know Trevor Noah is from Johannesburg. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> just a lot of amazing people are from there and so am i yeah but i moved to cape town i think in the late 90s so about 1998 and i went to primary school and high school there i went to Wanba girls junior school and Wanba girls high school and when i was done with high school i decided i didn't want to go to a place where i knew anyone so obviously i packed my bags and i went to rhodes university <laughs> where i think i only study? I did my undergrad in anthropology and politics, and then I did my honors degree in international studies and politics. Oh, snap. Okay. So how did you get into radio from that? (laughs) Such a smart girl. Yeah, I mean, I I can imagine some people in your family were probably like, you know, you're going places, you're going to be a politician, or you're going to, you know, change the world in those ways. And instead, you utilize that to... You know, obviously, like, that's super useful for analyzing and bringing people the news. But how did that all come about? I think, oh, the second I got, you know, you get to varsity and there's they do like a whole day where they're like, okay, these are the societies we've got available. These are the clubs we've got available. These are the different, you know, extracurricular activities you can get involved in. And so... It was called, it still is called, actually, the um, university radio station, Rhodes Music Radio, was signing people up. And they were like, hey, you can come and, like, audition and, you know, we'll see if we take you. And this was literally in my second year of, sorry, my second week of my first year in university. And I signed up and I auditioned and they took me. And that literally changed the entire trajectory of my life. I obviously wasn't going to stop studying, so I continued with my studies, and I, and I, you know, I liked everything I did very much. I mean, I'm not going to lie; I didn't attend any lectures in undergrad, but I, I you know, I still passed. Um, you like And then books. when I, <laughs> when I did my honors, you know, I really, I really enjoyed that sort of intimate class setting. So I think I was able to do um, much better academically. But the entire time I was on the radio, I was living, breathing, eating radio i was learning how to produce i was learning how to make jingles i was on air almost every day reading the news reading the sports presenting shows doing top 40s interviewing celebrities all of it and so 
I never looked back, literally. Ever, ever, ever. And that's how I ended up here. When I graduated after my honors degree, I started, I, I thought to myself, okay, should I phone like the, the Department of International Relations and like try and get a job? Or should I like, which government department can I like, must I affiliate myself with a political party? I remember at the time, my friend Mbalinduli, who you might know, um, had just been, been recruited. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she's, yeah, she's a great supporter of the arts in South Africa. And I've known her she for is. years. Yeah. So Mbali, at the time, we were in the same year and we were friends. And she'd just been recruited to start with like the DA Youth League and stuff like that. And I looked at her and I was like, yeah, I should do what Mbali's doing. I'm going to get into like a political party and then I'm going to start my political career and I'm going to be an ambassador. Like I had all of these wild dreams. And then something in me said, you're not going to fucking do that. Call every single radio station in this country right now and ask them if they need a newsreader. So that's what I did. I got the numbers of every single radio station in the country, and I just started making cold calls. Every time I'd be like, can I speak to your station manager? Can I speak to your programs manager? Hello, sir. I know you don't know me. My name is Sibs Matiela. I'm a newsreader. Please, can I work for you? Some of them were like, ha, 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 go to hell. Rejected. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And one of them, the very first commercial radio station in Bumalanga, actually, which was based in Nelspreet, Tony Morell was the programs manager there at the time. And he was like, come through. And I was like, okay. And then I had to go to Nelspreet for a job interview from Cape Town. And I didn't know how I was going to get there. So I remember like I took a bus to Johannesburg. Then in Johannesburg, I took a taxi to Nelspreet. Yeah. I'd never been on a long distance taxi in my life. But anyway, I made it to Nelspreet. I booked this strange like motel thing to stay at the next morning I put like my nicest clothes on and I went and I had this interview and this guy's like okay prove it prove that you're as good as you say you are I'm putting you on air right now and Tony Morell stopped <laughs> everything took the newsreader off air at the time and said go and I read the news and literally everyone stopped and I finished and I was shaking I literally <laughs> couldn't breathe. I was shaking and trembling like a leaf. And he said, pack your bags, go to Cape Town, pack up all of your things and be back here next week. Wow. Like that's like a dream. You know that that's a movie. Yeah. Like that is genuinely like straight out of a movie. Like that is insane. So you did it. You got the job yeah. and you were like, cool, I am bouncing. And I guess you got to be in a city you'd never been in before, meet new people, have an adventure. But what was going yeah. through your mind at that point? I was super excited. So the reason I was excited about Nelspreet is because the boy I was dating happened to oh. live there at the time. So this was also part of my adventure. I was now this grown up with a job that paid money and I was going to pay rent, <laughs> you know, and buy an L-shaped yeah. couch. And I was going to do fun stuff with my boyfriend on the weekends. And it was all incredibly exciting. Nelspreet was uh, interesting, uh, but definitely I learned so much from all of my colleagues in such a short space of time. And it's, it's the best thing that could have ever happened to me, I think. I think for people listening who are trying to get into radio and are willing to make those kind of decisions and those kind of sacrifices, that might be an option. You know, instead of sending your demo to 5FM, instead of sending your demo to, you know, the big radio stations, your metros and all of that, look at all the regional radio stations in the different provinces and mm. try it that way. But yeah, yeah cause I mean, if, if you're young and up and coming, uh, that, that might be, if you can make sacrifices like that, if you can yeah. just move to another province in a week, then that seems like it's not a bad idea to get that experience. And what yeah. happened from Nelspreet? When, how long did that last? And yeah, when did you move to five? So I stayed in Nelspreet for a year and then <laughs> dumbest decision of my life. Well, I don't know, because it, I don't know, it led to good things. The guy I was dating at the time and I broke up and then I was obviously devastated. It was my fault. I accidentally cheated on him. So <laughs> no, it wasn't. And I, I, I feel deep remorse and regret. Uh, what do you mean accidentally? I just, I fell on someone else. Um, sure. Okay. Yeah. And uh, 
to this day, I'm very remorseful and I'm very sorry for what I did. But obviously, you know, my whole life was now up in smoke. Everything was ruined. And so I had to quit my job and move back home because I was devastated and nothing could ever be okay again. So dramatic. Oh, to be to fair, be I was 21. Yeah. Exactly. In my 20s. So To be young and heartbroken. Mm, I packed up my stuff and I moved back to Cape Town into my mom's house, which it turns out is exactly where I needed to be that year because that would be the year that um, I lost my dad. And oh. so he had come down to Cape Town pretty close to my birthday. He still lived in Amtata and my mom lived in Cape Town and he had come to visit, you know, near to my birthday. And He'd had like complications with his diabetes and he developed kidney failure and he was in and out of dialysis, but otherwise fine. You know, he was taking the necessary treatment and everything was okay. And one day he went for one of his dialysis treatments and he didn't come back. And the next morning, oh yeah, I remember because in the evening he phoned and he said, oh, I'm at the hospital. They've admitted me. Are you going to come and see me? And I was like, oh, no. I mean, surely you'll be back tomorrow morning. You go for this all of the time. And also I've got yoga. So I'm going to go to yoga um, and then I'll come see you tomorrow, not knowing that that would be the last time I spoke to him. So the next morning I was the only person at home. The police came. They knocked on the door and they were like, are you related to this person? I was like, yep. And they were like, do you mind coming with us? And I was like, okay. And then they drove me to the hospital. And I had to phone like my mom and my sisters. And then I got there and yeah, things deteriorated pretty quickly. Um, and we lost him that evening. So wow. sorry, the point of this entire sub story is that, yes, it was incredibly dramatic for now me to be like, oh, woe is me. My life is over. My boyfriend and I are not together. I'm leaving this city. And I'm going back home. But sometimes, you know, the universe pushes you in a direction. And even if it feels irrational at the time, you end up being in the perfect place at the perfect time. Because if I hadn't been there when I lost my dad and I was far away or like, in, you know, we were incredibly close. And I, I, I don't think I would have recovered if I wasn't able to say goodbye. I think as I imagine at least with you being in Cape Town, you were able to be there for your mom and like your family in general would have probably been able to handle the situation yeah. a lot better than being separate. I know because I'm dealing, I've been dealing with stuff like that at the moment with my grandparents and yeah. having family far away who aren't able to help and be a part of things. I know that they are. And you've got to grow up like fucking atheist. quickly. Like one minute you're the last born, the next you're phoning funeral homes and being like, hi, can you come pick up the body of my parent at this hospital? <laughs> like it's crazy. Yeah. And all the decisions and all the stuff that needs to then be sorted out in terms of estates and in terms of the will and in terms of, yeah, all those things, it's just a headache and a nightmare and it just drags on for so long. So it is one of those things that you really do need yeah. family. You need people around you to be able to get through those moments because yeah. I, I, I can imagine if you were alone at that time, it would have been absolutely devastating. Yeah. But from there, what, what happened from there? So oh, your father's yeah. passed and <laughs> yeah. So I'm back in Cape Town, you know, I'm deep inside my morning. Um, so I don't think I was even focused at the time on like necessarily getting back on air because I wasn't in the right space. But a few months later, you know, I started now looking at Cape Town Station, sending my demo out, doing the same thing again, phoning radio stations and being like, <laughs> hi, I'm Sibs Machila. You probably don't know who I am, but, you know, I want to read the news at your station. And an incredible man who was the programs manager at Good Hope FM and actually still is, Gerard Muller, gave me a shot. And he was like, OK, we need someone to read the news for like one Saturday a week. Can you do it? And I was like, yeah. And I was working another like nine to five in Stellenbosch. Like I was working six days a week, but I didn't care because I was like, I get to be back on the radio again. And from there, I did that. Um, I used to work on the teen show with Carl Wastey, who is still a very good friend of mine and an incredible broadcaster. 
And yeah, the year after that, then I was moved to weekday. So I worked on weekend breakfast with Guy McDonald and Carl Wasty. Kim Clutter came on there as the newsreader and I was the traffic reporter. That happened for a year. And then I worked with Nigel Pierce for, I think, two years. Yeah. Yeah. It was a whole thing. I only know him as a meme because of the, like, I don't know Cape Town Radio that well. And then just when he wilded out on Instagram once and then went viral that way. So <laughs> that's what I was saying. That's my only knowledge of Nigel Pierce, unfortunately. But what yeah. I was going to say was you mentioned people being good broadcasters there. And I wanted to know to, what to you makes someone a good broadcaster? A good broadcaster for me is a great storyteller, someone who is authentic and someone who can use their own life, I guess, or own perspective to connect with others. I think at the end of the day, and again, this is, you know, my subjective opinion, is that broadcasting is about people. It's not about who's in front of the mic. It's about who's on the other side. I grew up listening to the radio where for me it was about having a companion and having a friend and someone to keep me company, someone to make me laugh occasionally or tell me an interesting story or someone who made me feel seen. And I think maintaining that connection is is what makes someone a, a good broadcaster. I think going into broadcasting for the right reasons is very important because it determines, you know, how good you'll be. By the right reasons, you mean not for fame, basically, because that no, is yeah. like why wow, some people get into it. That it, yeah, it's it's like a you know, for some people, it it is a, a stepping stone. Like, oh, if if I do this, then you know, I'll get enough following to be. You know, we've we've seen these stories play out, and at the end of the day, it's there's no longevity there because people aren't necessarily trying to make this a, a substantial and meaningful and impactful career. They're in it for their own reasons. And that's when things like that don't last very long. And you can tell from the get go and, you know, they fly in and fly out. But yeah, I, it's honestly like, honestly, it's just about connection. Like for me, I know that every time I am on air and I open my mouth, it's important to me to represent like the LGBTQAI plus community because I'm part of that community. So if we're having a conversation and someone's like, oh, what about your boyfriend? Then I know I'll be like, or oh, girlfriend, do you know what I mean? Like little, yeah. little simple things like that, that can change the way someone feels on the other side of that. Who's like, oh, thank God, like I'm being represented. Oh, thank God. They're talking about me. They're talking to me, you know? Yeah. I definitely yeah. representation hella matters and so well that was one thing I didn't necessarily realize about you is that you're queer and you're mentioning having a boyfriend and a girlfriend so do you mind me asking I mean I can take this no. out if not but yeah where on oh, the wait, spectrum what's your question of queerness <laughs> where on the spectrum of queerness are you and when did you discover that my queerness oh god um what an interesting question I don't know if anyone's ever asked me this um <laughs> I guess, I guess deep down you always know. It's okay. just about, you know, having the freedom to pursue your most authentic self. A lot of people yeah. like myself find that freedom, you know, when they leave home and when they're in varsity or some kind of tertiary institution and are surrounded by like many, many different people who are all living their individual truths. And you try this and you try that, smoke a bit of weed, decide it's not for you, you know, drink some beer, decide you prefer Savannah instead, kiss some girls and realize that you really fucking like it <laughs> and you want to <laughs> date them. So <laughs> that's how I came about my queerness, you know, just experimentation. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, besides that, I was very lucky my very first encounter as someone who thought, you know, they were a heterosexual was falling in love with the most incredible woman in the world. And we had a, you know, a longstanding and wonderful and lovely relationship. Yeah. And I think that just cemented it for me. That was like, 
you know, because it obviously comes with, I think the discovery comes with a lot of doubt and insecurity and yeah, I can imagine. just in a turmoil, especially, you know, I'm, I come from a, you know, Christian family or rather my mom is very Christian. I'm a Christian as well. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I read the Bible occasionally don't attend church because too traumatized because they treat the gays like shit. So yeah. I refuse to go. But it doesn't change, you know, my belief in there being a higher power that is God. And so I think, you know, it, it's a really, it's a time of reckoning now for yourself where you have to ask yourself these really like difficult questions about like, am I a bad person? Is this evil? Is this wrong? Will I go to hell? And blah, blah, blah. But Fortunately for me, that came so easily because in my mind, I was like, I could never be this in love with a human being and want nothing but the best for them. And just to like keep them in a bubble and take care of them for the rest of my life. That could never be wrong, like on any planet. So Amen. fuck whatever anyone has to say. And that was so quick for me. Like it wasn't difficult. It wasn't like a long, arduous, like I need counseling process. I was just like, fuck it. I have nothing but good intentions. And so does this person. And that's enough. And so I think that's helped me navigate, you know, like a lot of my other relationships, like my current partner at the time, who is a very, very lovely lady who, you know, I love very much is so different because I think for her, it's still such a struggle to come to terms with all of that, just balancing her faith with you know, us <laughs> and her sexuality. I see the struggle and I, I see the difficulty and I see the doubt and I see what other people say, you know, super ugly things, super like, will I lose my family or do I, how, what do I have to sacrifice to be who I am? And it's really fucking unfair for some people. Like, I'm not saying I've had the easiest journey on earth. I've had some drama with my mom lately, but I don't want to get into it. But like, it's really fucking hard for a lot of queer people. And that's so fucking sad because everyone is just trying to live their best life. We can all be happy. There's enough room in the world for us all to mind our business, drink water and be happy. Oh, yeah, that is one of the horrible things about this world is that for some reason, well, it's not for some reason, it's because we're intentionally programmed and we're intentionally made, you know, we're socialized to think certain ways and to, yeah, like that the world should be like this. And there's people in power and there's people in control who have a vested interest in making people think those ways. But it's, it is horrific that we can't just live our fucking lives, you know, as individuals without other people interfering. And it's because of all this weird propaganda that's happened from so many different places. Yeah. Like that's the thing when it comes to like anti-queerness, it is so many different things that, that are com coming together essentially. Yeah. And yeah, like it's one of those things in South Africa, you see it constantly, like especially on Twitter and I can only imagine in the actual streets. I mean, it's not something yeah. I have to deal with. Although I remember being in high school and I was called a fag constantly. Like <laughs> my entire high school career was. What are the was, names of those guys? Give me their names and their addresses. <laughs> it was half the high school, to be completely honest with you. That is what boys' schools <laughs> are like, unfortunately, or at least were like when I was growing up. Was just yeah. you were just called gay, and that was the biggest insult anyone could give you. Yeah, <laughs> personally, so I gay. never found so it to be gay. that insulting. Like it's thank like, you. <laughs> it's like, yeah, the gay people have always been doing the coolest shit. So I don't I don't get how you're, you know, saying that as an insult. But yeah, man, school is a fucked up place in the first place. And a lot of that stuff, a lot of that conditioning does carry over into society. It is Absolutely. something that people keep with them. It's also parents, you know, instill that in their kids because they don't want their kids to be different. A lot of the time, you know, you just want your kids to be normal and get a good job. And, yeah. you know, you can be proud of them for the neighbors and all of that. So, <laughs> yeah, man, I I can empathize, but I actually don't know the lived experience. So, yeah, thank you for sharing. I mean, yeah, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry people were fuck nuts to you. Oh, whatever. I mean, I dealt with like I it sucked in school. Like I dealt with a lot of shit in school and that's like. But it really did strengthen my resolve. And 
it's always been one of those things where it's like I've known that I am different at least like I've like I'm not queer I have thought that maybe I'm bi sometimes but like I'm on that like you know everyone's a little bit bi like I I definitely agree (laughs) with that statement but I know that you know my attraction to men isn't that deep it's not something that yeah like I've ever necessarily I mean I've kissed dudes and stuff like that but it's not one of those things where I'm like I'm queer but I can understand in some ways because I have had those questions at least yeah okay let's uh let's chat about voice over at uh, voice over work because this is <laughs> weirdly enough why you are here because yeah I did and it is my bread and butter yeah well yeah so this is what we're going to definitely be getting into because it's such an interesting industry in that like I don't think many people know that this is a thing that you could do with your life if you have a good voice you can actually do it and you can do it from home if you've got like the right setup and everything mm. but it's got its little intricacies and its little tricks because I listen to your um <laughs> well your portfolio I guess you listen to and my show got- real <laughs> <laughs> yes of course i wanted to know what the vibe is like you know oh, i wanted to know God. the differences because you know it's something that's been in my mind but i did a survey for this podcast and people were saying a couple people were like oh they'd love to hear from voiceover artists and you came as one of the best recommended ones when i put hey it out now. there on twitter so how Look did you me, get into voiceover management. work? <laughs> <laughs> i think it comes with the territory i think um And I know that's a silly way to answer the question, but obviously I'm not done. I have always known Mm -hmm. that I would work primarily with my voice. I think growing up as a young girl, I thought I would be a singer or some kind of, you know, speaker until I developed a (laughs) a crazy fear for public speaking, which is weird (laughs) because I'm on the radio, but it's, it's different. And so I guess after I, you know, started working on the radio, then, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd start doing promos. We had to learn to do promos where you like promote a show like every Friday at 7 p.m. It's me, Sibs, presenting the South African Top 40, you know, and... um. Okay, so, what, voice, what voice did you just do there? If I was a client, what would I have asked for to get that voice? Oh, my God. Like a, I don't know, like a soft sound? Is that bright? <laughs> it's okay. like bright? Okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay, sorry. Yeah, carry on there. <laughs> It's a Sibs voice, God damn it. But yeah, so I mean, we, I, I mean, I did that out of necessity because I needed to promote my show only to later discover that no, sometimes, and I thought it was part and parcel of, you know, being on radio later to discover that no, this is a separate thing. And in fact, it's a career all on its own. So there are people yeah. who literally have paid off their bonds and have very nice houses. Carol Ofori, looking at you. Um, No, I'm joking. I don't know what her bond is like, (laughs) but she's killing the voiceover game. But I mean, who like that's their primary source of income. And they, they do voiceovers for like corporate functions, television ads, radio ads. um, Fuck. What else? Uh, Radio stations, you know, the American voice that people hear on Metro FM, you're listening to Metro FM. Is Roger good? Like no one (laughs) No one could have ever guessed that that's Roger. It's Roger good. I mean I can guess that, but like now that you've told me (laughs) I hadn't guessed that before. (laughs) You learn all sorts of interesting ways to like play with your voice and use your voice and then discover that oh fuck, I can make money from this. And then you're like yeah, that's what I'm going to do. So you get an agent because usually, you know, companies will go to a talent agent to be like, hey, I need a voiceover for ABC. I'm selling tomato sauce. I need the voice to sound like it really loves tomato sauce. Who do you have? Who are you going to suggest? And then they send off a bunch of um, show reels of different people, female, male, black, white, uh, you know, what kind of accent would you like? Should they sound Spanish? Is it a Spanish tomato sauce? Is it an Afrikaans tomato sauce? They send like the whole brief and the job specs and then, you know, they hire someone, you go into studio, you record the thing and you're done. So, you know, I tried for a long time to get into voiceovers because I knew, you know, I had the talent and the capacity. And no one would take me. 
So I did the same thing. Radio. I promise you, I did the same thing I did for like trying to get onto radio. I call, cold called, you know, the talent agencies, the talent management agencies. I was like, hi, I'm Sims Matila. I work at this radio station and I would like to be a voiceover artist, blah, blah, blah. And every time, and this is when I still lived in Cape Town, they rejected me. And I would send like multiple emails with examples of my work, different voices of me doing different things. And they were just like, no. And so, so is like voiceover like a closed community? Like, is it like this network of people that just know each other and then they give each other work? I think initially it was like that because I'm also talking about like 2011 when I was yeah. now trying to, you know, get my you know, foot in the door. And eventually the only way I was able to book voiceover work was going directly to people I knew in the creative space who were doing things that would require voice work. So I'd approach someone who was a filmmaker or a documentary maker and say, hey, I know you're doing this thing. Do you need someone to voice it? And I'd literally get paid peanuts, but I just wanted the work experience to be able to put on my show reel, to be able to go back to these agents and say, please represent me. I, I can, you know, we can work together and do really well at this. No one in Cape Town ever took me for as long as I was there, for as long as I worked there, no one wanted me. Just rejection left, right and center. I think um, I might have an idea there. Because like you're saying, Cape Town makes it sound like race might have become an issue there. Like, or might have been, that's just from my perspective, like, because I'm assuming you moved to Joburg and things changed. Yeah, absolutely. And here's the thing about Cape Town is that a number of my friends were with agents um, okay. and they'd send me emails and be like, no, here's the person's contact details, contact them, blah, blah, blah. And then just for some reason, I don't know, when it came to me, they wouldn't take me. I still don't know why till this day. Anyway. I managed to book my own jobs occasionally and I made it work that way. When I moved to Johannesburg, my best friend, Taryn Louch, who is also a voiceover artist, was like, oh, now that you're here, great. This is my agent. Phone him, tell him I sent you and then work from there. And luckily, you know, I just got in this job at 5FM. So obviously I could use that name. And so I phoned ONS Management. I think I sent an email or Taryn sent like an introduction email, like, hey, Owen, this is my best friend, Serbs. She works at 5FM. She's a great voiceover artist. And then obviously now with that backing of like, oh, you even work in like broadcasting. So your voice must be good. Got me again, a foot in the door. And also another person vouching for me who was already from inside. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So that gave me an opportunity to now go to a studio. Owen invited me to like come to the studio, him and Lance, who are amazing, by the way, best agents in the game. I'm obsessed with them and I love them so much. And they got me into studio and we recorded show reels and they signed me up. And then I started booking voiceover jobs. And literally it That's was like my entire... After all that hustle. Dude, my entire life changed. And first it was like a slow start, right? Because obviously I'm moving to Johannesburg for the first time. People don't know me. I've only been on 5FM for a few months. So those first well, few listen, months... Just, like, just stop. Stop for one second there. Yeah. We'll we'll get back to it. But what inspired the move to Joburg? And had you already been working for 5FM and doing outside broadcasts from Cape Town? Or did you move to Joburg for the 5FM job? No. So I was working at Good Hope FM in Cape Town. Yeah. And Good Hope is a sister station to 5FM because they're all under the SABC banner. So the SABC owns about 73%, I think, of radio property across the country. And obviously, as with most companies, sometimes they like to hire or look internally first before they go outside. Okay. Um, so I had already, I think I reached out to the management of Metro and Five, which were my dream jobs. I've always dreamt of working at 5FM and at Metro FM. And fortunately, oh, I know what happened. 5FM, I don't know if I can say this, was meeting with someone very close to me who I was on radio with at the same time. It may or may not have been my very good friend, Carl Wasty, who I love and adore. And then while they were meeting, he was meeting like the programs manager. And then he was like, this is all great, but do you know Sibs? Because you should take her on. And they were like, oh, who's Sibs? And then he was like, let me put you on. And then now people were phoning me because this other guy, again, the power of recommendation guys <laughs> word of mouth <laughs> yeah the Absolutely. thing is if people hadn't been listening to this whole like 
conversation we've had, they would just be like, oh, that's nepotism. But when they hear all the hustling you had to do to get to that point of someone else mentioning yeah. your name in those conversations, it's like, no, there's so much fucking work that goes into just getting into that position where someone yeah. says... Yeah, like literally giving up my weekends to wake up on a Saturday morning at the crack of dawn to go to work for like one shift a week just to get my name out there so I could work towards like getting a better shift and a better shift and a better shift, you know? So, it, yeah, I ended up now in a meeting and then there was a position that opened up and then 5FM hired me and I was like, fuck yeah, I'm moving to Johannesburg. I've always wanted to move to Johannesburg and then I moved to Johannesburg. So was that your first time moving, going to Joburg, basically? Yeah. Your Mtata, Cape Town, Null Cape, Cape Town, Cape Town Joburg. Town. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. quite a journey. <laughs> and and so you got to Joburg, you're working for 5 FM, and then you started with the voiceover. Yeah. So I joined with my agent, ONS. And, you know, like I'm saying, it was it was slow, 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 slow at the beginning. But, you know, and you're not always going to get, like, the big jobs. Sometimes you're not even going to get any job. But, like, you won't start off being a voiceover artist and immediately be booked for, like, the biggest television campaign that's going to pay you a trillion bucks, you know. You'll start with, like, 800 rand gigs or, like, 500 rand gigs here and there, sometimes volunteer stuff, just to improve your craft and also to have more to put on your portfolio. And who gives you feedback in these situations? Is it your management or is it the people who are producing you at the time? Or how do you actually get better at doing voiceover, essentially? You know, because you're going in there, you're doing the recording. Is someone telling you, hey, I want it more like this or like that? Or does someone talk to you afterwards <laughs> and say, this is what you need to do in the future? Or, or you just yeah. left on, the, on your own there? So usually they'll say beforehand, like they'll give direction and they'll be like, this is what we're looking for. We're looking for quite a pacey read, you know, upbeat, smiling, sort of young and, and vibrant. And you'll be like, oh, okay, Shep. Sometimes usually the client is there as well. Lately, because it's 2021 and we've had COVID, then the client joins via Zoom or via meetings or whatever. But there's more than one person it's not just you and the sound engineer for the most part yeah. there are other people there who know exactly what they want and are going to tell you no matter how it makes you feel they'll be like oh lord oh that was really pitchy and like you sound like a squirrel so if you could just <laughs> or like give you really strange directions like we'd like you to give us more but also less <laughs> like, what the fuck so a lot of the time you know when you're lucky you get really good direction you get a client who knows exactly what they want you get a good brief beforehand and you've just got people there to guide you um throughout the entire process so that everyone can leave the room happy because it's possible for me to go in and decide how i want to deliver something and do a fantastic job of it but if I'm smiling too much on a voiceover for a funeral home and I think I've done the greatest job on earth, you know, the client's not going to like that. And that is then useless to everyone. So it's really a give and take in terms of feedback and delivery. And you've got to be really, really open and not take things personally and not take things too seriously. Like it's not about you at the end of the day. It's a service that you're offering and you need to, the client, you know, client is king. You always need to give them what they want, no matter how ridiculous it sounds. It's their product. They know what they want. They know how you want, how they want you to do it. And that's what you show up and you do. You don't act like a diva. You don't add your own little twists. Sometimes you can, and they like that depending on how much creative room you have. But for the most part, you know, you get in, you listen, you do the job and you get out. I mean, it sounds really mundane and boring, but it's so fun. Like, I love my voiceover work so much. <laughs> but then how do, you, how do you get better at it? How do you know you're doing a good job? How do you practice? Do you sit at home with a microphone oh, and, you know, record yourself? Okay. Practice, 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 practice. And coaching is everything. How to breathe correctly, when to take breaths, when to put full stops and commas in places, you know, when to, like, where to stop your smile, where to, like like where how much to like lift your chin to 
project a certain kind of sound, how much to lower you. It's, it's a lot. Um, oh, wow. There is so much I don't know. I didn't know I had to do any of these things when I talk. Some people don't. Some people are complete naturals and they can walk in and they can just do it and everything will be fine. And um, that's a rare case. I think for anyone who wants to be a professional at something, it takes a lot of coaching and it takes a lot of practice and it takes a lot of mentorship and it takes a lot of listening. It takes a lot of listening to other people and what they have to say and how they do things or like just just maybe even copying and being like, okay, when Morgan Freeman reads a thing, this is what he sounds like. Let me see if I can try and do it like him, but with my own spin. So that's hours and hours and hours of you just picking shit up and reading it and reading it in different ways, different tones, different paces, you know reading happy, reading sad, reading with a smile, reading with no smile, reading like a teenager or like someone who's really excited or reading like it's for children or like being really sensual because this is adult content and, you know, it, it just depends. It takes hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. Does it like drive 10, your girlfriend hours? crazy? No, she likes it. Is it fun? Okay. <laughs> I mean, imagine if every night you fell asleep to the sound of my voice. Okay, I'm starting to think that maybe this is one of your side gigs that you do. That maybe you've got a phone sex line going, or maybe that might be your next thing that you're going to do. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that was too good. That was yeah. No, you like I said, you know what you're doing when it comes to this thing. <laughs> so. Which is so funny, right? Because I'm just getting started. There are so many professionals in the field who have been doing this for so many years who, like I've said, literally pay their bills and their mortgages and, you know, because that's how, that's how good they are. They're booking international gigs. They're booking daily gigs. Like some of us will only, like I'll only get a voiceover gig like maybe once a week, even once a month on a bad month. And there are people who are like every single day, international organizations, MC gigs, TV ads, radio ads, corporate things all over the place. Like I'm literally bottom of the barrel. But no, but from what I've picked up from this conversation, you'll probably work your way up there in no time. Like it's just- well, I'm hoping you... so. <laughs> I know, I know this last little period has broken your spirit a little bit, but from everything I've heard tonight, you are tenacious as fuck. So I don't doubt that yeah, you're going to definitely get through this period and yeah, be stronger for it. It is unfortunate, but fuck, you can't control you know outside forces when it comes to life. And at least yeah. you are able to diversify your portfolio and do a number of different things. Yeah. I do want to circle back though to the beginning where I asked uh, if you've ever said anything on air that you shouldn't have said. So if you'd like to share that story now, please do so. <laughs> no, I mean, I've said about, I've said about everyone has said things on air that they shouldn't have said. Yeah, Let's see, what have I gotten BCCSA complaints for? Oh, so if you got I got a BCC, complaint. Yeah, like people write in and they say this person should be fired because they said this. The ones I got at 5FM... The one time we were on air, it was myself, it was still the Tabuti show. So it was myself, Tano Tabete, and Justin Tureen. And it was around matric exams. And I think the exam that day was agriculture. So we used to do, do this feature where we do mock questions. And then anyone who's listening, who's not like a matriculant, must answer the question. They'd be like, yeah, you would have passed the matric exam paper kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So we, they threw out this question about agriculture. And then I think I said something along the lines of, yeah, but definitely the answer is give us back the land. <laughs> ah, then they lost it. And they started writing in and they started emailing and they were like, she should be taken off air. She's inciting violence in our country. She, what does she mean? The land, whose land, blah, blah. So I got into deep shit for that. And then there was another time. That, what was the response yeah. like from the, so the, so the station was like, no, what you said was bad. Or was it just the people complaining? Because it was people complaining. And I did get into trouble like with my management. And I think their main point was that, cool, whatever. Say, you can say what you want to say, but at the end of the day, as broadcasters and entertainers, we can't be divisive um, and treat yeah. our audience in a sort of um, 
antagonistic way. <laughs> yes, exactly. And so fine, you know, if, if I wanted to go back into the annals of history and justify why I've made these statements or this particular statement, it could be justifiable. But at the end of the day, that's not what you're there for. the most productive thing to do in a space where you're trying to retain listeners and also entertain them. Yeah, fair enough. So but then, it is one of the those restrictions. One. That is one of the restrictions of okay. radio, unfortunately. That is one of the restrictions of radio, unfortunately. Yeah, exactly. Is that because you're trying really to reach to... many people, you have to, yeah, yeah, you you got to go like around little corners and like weird ways. You know, you can't say what you actually mean half the time. Yeah, but you can be super smart about it, and you know, you can just be a smart person and know how to put things without necessarily having to say them out loud. Yeah, saying the quiet um, part out loud, as they say. Yeah, exactly. And then the second time, we were, it was now we were on the Tabuti Drive. So it was uh, Tando Tabete, Mcizi James, Duran Collett, and myself, which is by far the best team I've ever worked on on radio. And I miss it with my entire heart. But anyway, it's fine. One day is one day. Mm. And we were talking about, it was round about Easter time. And we were talking about you know, the Easter weekend and people drinking and, you know, stuff like that. So then CZ James said something along the lines of it's Easter time. So like people mustn't get drunk and something along those lines, like don't drink and drive, don't get drunk. And I said, Jesus wants us to be lit. And then everyone was like, what? And I was like, this is the same man who turned water into wine jesus wants us to live our best lives and drink as much as we want and get lit god made us so we could get lit ah uh, then i was in shit because <laughs> the christians came for me what does she mean it's blasphemous uh... <laughs> but, yeah you're gonna get that almost no matter what if you mention god or jesus or anything like with regards to that and you're not wrong yeah. he literally was at a wedding and made the wedding better because Thank he you. was like yo let's make this water wine and the people and were having the was thanked him. they were like dude you made this so much better thank you thank like, you <laughs> exactly that was my whole point people need jesus to made the, the party lit they don't know <laughs> oh cool well thank you <laughs> for that i think that does bring us to the end here it's been quite a fun chat and i've really enjoyed getting to a know you and b getting to know what you do and what the realities of a lot of these situations are because you know we hear people on the radio every day and you also hear adverts and you hear all kinds of voiceover stuff without even really registering that hey that's a person who's doing this thing so i think it's really cool for people yeah. to get an understanding of what this life is like so thank you you're welcome. And this was super fun because I've had a podcast and no one's ever had me on their podcast before. So <laughs> this was amazing for me. A first of, I hope, many. Yeah, well, as um, the podcasting industry in South do... Africa grows and uh, your 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 yeah. new podcast takes off, I'm sure many more people will be inviting you on. I hope so. But I, I also do want to say, just back on the topic of access, I think I access was incredibly difficult you know like I said for me my story was tricky in the sense that I kept getting rejected for unknown reasons and it was it, it took years and years and years um for me to even get representation and so what I would suggest for people wanting to be you know professional voiceover artists is obviously first of all to keep practicing get a coach get a mentor get someone who can help you you know perfect your craft and just hone your skills. And then if you can't get an agent or representation, then there are groups on Facebook. I don't know what they're called right now. I think one of them is like South African voiceover something, something. But if you just search like South African voiceover artists, then you'll find some groups on Facebook as well. And maybe you can join those. And then sometimes people will put up ads and say, oh, I'm looking for a Zulu speaking male voiceover artist. And you'll be able to reply to those and try out for those positions. There's also a group on Facebook called The Resource, which is, I think, for yeah. the creatives. Um, yeah, The Resource is a hell of a resource. Yeah, it's a great resource. 
Um, and so sometimes there as well, you'll find um, postings for people looking for voiceovers. So you'll be able to audition for those as well. Obviously, you need to make sure that you do have a voice reel. You can't just say, oh, I want to do voiceovers, hire me. And then you've got no examples to give of your work. And that's why the practice and the recording preferably in a professional recording space is so important because that's your first step. That's the first thing that people hear or get to know of you. And that's, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? First impression. That's the first impression people will get of you is, you know, how professional you sound on your show reel. So obviously if you've recorded it on your phone, which I know, you know, it's difficult it's out, for it's some fun. people because that's all they have. To um, practice is probably good. Yeah. But just like, you know, try and just make it as soundproof as possible, as quiet as possible, as professional as possible. If you don't have a quiet space, go into your cupboard, go Get into in your car. I can't tell you how many times I've recorded voiceovers in the back seat of my car inside a garage because it was the quietest and most soundproof place for me to be. Wow. Um, in so a just, car. That's, that doesn't yeah. sound soundproof to me. So that's insane. What? Okay. Because I'm just trying to think of the acoustics in the car, but I guess it does actually work. Because it's it just works. soft like, stuff around you and it's small. So, yeah. Yeah. Like sometimes I'll cover myself with a blanket and I'll do yeah. stuff like that just to keep the noise out. So a show reel or a demo is very, very important. And then lastly, there are some online sites that will take like amateur or starting out. I'm using amateur with inverted commas, which you can't see. Uh, there's a site called voices.com, which is an international site. And then you can do like the free membership thing and then upload your voice reel. And then when they match you with a voice, they'll invite you to audition. And then maybe you might be eligible for that. There's another one called voices one, two, three. There's another one called Covoco, C O V O C O, um, dot com. You can do that there as well. And I think Fiverr, um, oh. Also really? has a section I mean, Fiverr there for is fantastic yeah. in general for creatives because it's such a great way to make extra money. I genuinely mm -hmm. didn't even think that voiceover, but like if you are a creative of any sort, not even just voiceover, like if you're a writer, designer, you do games, exactly. whatever it is, go check out Fiverr because it used to be about doing a job for five dollars, but it is no longer that. Yeah. Yeah, it's about uh, using your resources. The internet is always your friend, Google is always your friend you'll find what you're looking for. You'll find the people that you're looking for. You'll find the resources that you need and just begin to invest in yourself. Like I had to take money out of my own pocket to buy myself a better microphone that costs thousands of rands. I was very disgruntled about that purchase, but at the end of the day, it makes my delivery and my product and my offering to the client better. And that keeps my clients coming back because they like what they hear. So you have, it's a constant investment in yourself. Yeah, both in your equipment and in your skill set. So, yeah, that's it's a great way to look at life in general. It's just to constantly be investing in yourself. And like I've said throughout this, that's kind of what you've done. Like you constantly just bet on yourself. And for the most part, the bets have worked off. You just now need to place a new bet, I guess. That's, that's <laughs> Yeah. The, like that. that's I think where we're at. And I'm looking forward to seeing where you go to from here. Where in the immediate future um, can people look out for you? Are you doing anything at the moment or can people just find you on Twitters and stay in touch that way? I think maybe Twitter is the best. So at Siba Piwe on Twitter, S-I-B-A-P-H-I-W-E. Um, but yeah, I'm literally, I'm still, it sounds ridiculous, but I'm still reeling and I'm still processing and I'm still planning and I'm still thinking. So I don't want to say, oh, I'll be doing this. I'll be releasing a new podcast like in the next month or like, oh, catch me on wherever, wherever, because I literally have no idea in which direction the universe is sending me. But I'm going and I'm putting my big girl panties on. And when I arrive, I'll let everyone know. <laughs> uh thank you so much once again we'll we'll chat again hopefully in a few years and we'll see what the end results of uh this uncertainty all is yay May i hope i'll have paid off a, a mortgage by then 